Sorry. <laughs> My bad. This, this group has a completely different experience. They come at the world with a completely different mindset. And they bring with them biases and behaviors and ways of thinking and looking at the world that are different. I don't fully get it, but Travis is going to help us understand it. So let's do it. Um, thank you guys so much for, for hosting me and for having me here. Uh, this is my first year at Red, so I've, I've never actually been here before. Um, and so my hat's off to Brad and Mike for putting together, putting together just a fabulous conference. And, and for everybody here, you guys are the most welcoming people I've ever met. Which is great because you're real estate agents, so you ought to be pretty friendly. So it's, you're off to a good start. And uh, it, it's, it's cool because I met a lot of you guys online first and actually got to know you via Twitter and Facebook and everything like that. And then to come here and to get the chance to meet face to face is really what this is all about. It's really everything that we've been talking about here at Redso. It's taking what we've been learning through these last couple of days and applying it in ways where we can connect with people in, in, in just a method that we couldn't before. I never would have been able to get to know as many of you as I have prior to showing up here were it not for Twitter and Facebook. And so the, the content here, what they're covering, what they're talking about is so critical, so important to the future of our businesses and to the future of this industry. And so what I really want to kind of talk to you about is, is we've got the technological force, we've got everything that we've been talking about with technology going, and I want to talk to you about the, the second of two major forces, technology being the first. The other is youth. Right now, there's a force of youth that are entering the marketplace, that are flooding the world. And what's happening is they're taking the tools of technology and they're revolutionizing how we work, how we live, how we act. Everything about what we do has been changing at such a rapid pace. And it's exhausting sometimes to try and keep up with it. And there's questions going around. What's the future? What's this, what's this all going to mean? And there's a lot of articles. Man, I read a lot of articles on millennials. And, and the big question, will millennials save the real estate industry? That's what everybody wants to know. Is this the generation that's going to save the real estate industry? Because let's be honest, it sucks right now. Nobody's sitting here going, you know, I just had the best year I've ever had. Unless you're a new real estate agent, then you probably did. But... <laughs> It can only get better, right? Um, you know, uh, that's, that's what we're going to talk about. So the, the question is, can they save it? And I'm here to tell you, no. This generation, the millennial generation, will not save the real estate industry. They're going to change the real estate industry. And that is a key, key difference. Because saving implies that we're going to get back to what was in 1990, 2000s, the war in 2000s, and everybody was just thrilled with how that went. And so when we talk about the saving of the real estate industry, everybody wants to get back to that. The problem is we never go back in time. We never revert back to anything. It's a constant progression forward. We've been learning that over the last two days. Everything is constantly in flux, constantly moving forward. So how do we as business owners prepare for that? So before I dive in, let me just tell you a little bit about myself and my background. Jeff mentioned it briefly. I'm not in real estate, not a real estate agent, no real estate background, bought a couple houses, but other than that, no real estate background. And, and my background is really business and technology. Spent 12 years working in small startups, starting a few of them myself, and then going all the way up to Fortune 500 companies like Countrywide Home Loans. So minor experience in that. We won't talk about them because they're not exactly uh, the most loved company in the U.S. right now. And uh, But in that time, work inside technology predominantly with millennials, starting all the way back in 1998, which is when we started to really kind of just enter the workforce. And there was this friction that I started to see between the younger generation and the generations that were in power within the organizations. And this friction... I originally chalked it up to a technological friction, thinking that, well, it's the, the geeks versus the non-geeks, it's the, 
the, the people who understand it versus the people who don't understand it. And what I realized is it's not really that. It's more than that. It's the value system. What, what people thought work should look like. What, how companies should be run. How companies should be operated. Everything about the generation that was coming in the workforce was different. They had very different expectations. And I started to realize that here's an opportunity because companies need to figure out how do you harness a generation that has been raised, as Jeff said, on this technology. To them, what we're learning here is second nature. They've been doing it since they came out of the womb. When I mean, you look at two-year-olds today, and they can work an iPad better than I can. It's crazy. It's, it, it, this is a generation that, that gets this stuff in a way that we need to, as, as business owners, find a way to take the, the tools of technology and harness that and, and combine that with the youth and bring it into the organization and then, then take the wisdom and the experience of the older generations and apply that together with youth, youth and technology to a bright, bright future. And so what I want to talk to you about is how they're going to change the real estate industry. How they're going to use the tools that we've been talking about over the last two days to really change how real estate looks, how we act in it, and then I'm going to have a special section for brokers at the end because there's a lot in there for brokers. How many brokers do I have in the room? Oh, good, good. Hang tight. This is going to get good. So, i got to get some water. All right. So let's talk about who millennials are. Jeff mentioned 1977 to 1995. That's the date range. That means that this year, they're going to be turning between 16 and 34 years of age. So if you're a baby boomer, kind of be thinking about that because they're predominantly the children of baby boomers. So if you're a baby boomer and you have kids, chances are good they're a millennial. And so what I'm talking about is your kids. These are the, these are the people that you've raised and these are the people that are flooding the marketplace. And so when we look at them, we go, okay, well, how big is this generation? What, what size are we talking about? Well, they're about 80 million strong. To put that in perspective, baby boomers are 78 million and shrinking. Sorry to say that, but mortality rates are, are starting to sink in, and it's a, it's, a, it's a dropping generation. So they're actually a bigger generation right now than the baby boomers. Compared to Gen X, I feel so bad for Gen X. I'm sorry, you guys. You're 40 million strong, so they're about twice your size. And <clears throat> they have a better grasp of the tools than, than most Xers do, so it's, it's creating a lot of friction in the workplace. I see more friction between Xers and Millennials than I do between Millennials and Boomers. Very fascinating. But this is a big generation. And right now, they are actually the largest generation inside the U.S. workforce. They make up 38% of all U.S. workers. That's more than the boomers, more than the Xers, and more than the silent generation. They are the largest population in the U.S. workforce. In three years, now it's going to get scary. In three years, they're going to be half of the U.S. workforce. In 10 years, that's 60%. This is a generation that is going to control business, that is going to control a large amount of the U.S. wealth, that's going to control the direction this country moves. It's going to impact every single business. We're already seeing it. The combination of these two factors is disrupting a lot of industries out there. And real estate is not immune. And so I hear all the time, well, are they actually buying houses? Sure, they're employed. And, and by the way, don't listen to the media reports. There are a lot of media reports about the laziness of this generation, about how this generation is not buying houses, how they're not making money, how they're not doing certain things. And like anything else, there's a fraction of truth in every news story, but the rest of it is, is crap. So here's the truth. Last year, according to the NAR, they purchased 42% of all homes sold in 2010. If you weren't working with millennials last year, missed out on 42% of the market. Now, I know there were extenuating circumstances. Everybody goes, well, yes, but there was the first time home buyer, home buyer tax credit. Sure. But are you going to turn away the leads just because they get a tax credit? They're buying houses, and they're going to continue to buy houses at an, at an accelerated rate. 
this generation is going to impact how real estate gets bought and sold. So how are they going to do that? What's, how are they going to change the marketplace? How are they going to change what real estate looks like, what builders start to build, and what homes start to, to become more desirable than other, desire, or than other properties? The first thing we have to do when we start talking about this is we have to examine the core values of this generation. How were they raised? What were they raised to believe? Because with this core value system, it dictates everything we believe is, is a direct is going to directly impact the decisions we make in our lives about where to live, where to work, uh, where we're going to, who we're going to marry, how many kids are we going to have. All these things are impacted by our value system. And there are four major trends, four trends that, that are impacted or that are impacting the decisions that this generation is making, four ways that they were raised that are going to be, you're going to start seeing in bigger, bigger quantities how it's going to impact every industry. The first one, they have a a, a huge desire for work-life balance. They are the children of baby boomers. Baby boomers are the hardest working, most successful generation in history. As measured monetarily, they are a very, very successful generation. Well, what did that mean to real estate? They bought big homes, on big lots, in nice cars, in the suburbs. The urban sprawl started before the boomers. The boomers just made it really pretty. The boomers, they, they built huge houses on big lots. That's what they wanted. That was a symbol of, of their success. Their kids, though, were looking at that going, you know what, I don't know that I want to work 80, 90, 70, 60, 50 hours a week. That's a lot. That's a lot of working. I want a little bit more balance in my life. On top of that, they look at the houses and they go, those big houses we grew up in, we're really grateful for our life. We're really grateful for how we were raised, but they actually, in studies, contribute. The, the millennials look at the, the big houses, and they actually say they were a factor in the rise in uh, divorce among their parents. Because they said everybody in the family had the opportunity to isolate themselves inside the house. And so they look at it and go, I don't know that I want as big of a house. Partially because you have to pay more, you have to earn more, you have to work more. It takes more to upkeep. So they're looking at it and they're going, I want a little bit more balance, a little bit more of, of a give and take. Plus, life expectancy is so much longer. They're going to be living a lot longer. So they feel, why do I need to get it all done by 55 or 65? I can work a lot longer. I can balance it out. So work-life balance is huge. The next one, and by the way, a couple of these that I'm going to talk about have been politicized. Unfortunately, I... Uh, and, and I'm going to ask your, your uh, patience with me because I'm not making any political statements and some of them are, are highly political topics. But it's important that we understand these trends because it is going to impact real estate. And so whether you agree or disagree, whether you're on the right or the left or the center, it doesn't matter. Just understand it and, and know that I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with anything. I'm just letting you know what's going on. Trend number two, multiculturalism. This generation was... Uh, raised with forced busing. They were raised to be around people of different backgrounds, different races, different socioeconomic statuses. They were raised to be tolerant, to be open-minded to everybody's belief system and their ideals and how they choose to live their life. Part of what that created is this desire for being in an eclectic environment. They don't like hanging out with everybody that looks, feels, and acts and thinks the same way they do. They like the change. They like being in, in a group of people that are different from it's a, it's a very interesting thing. Next one, collaborators. And I, I got a chance to talk with Christina Wise about this the other day, I think it was last night, and, and she was telling me in her agent, or in her brokerage, she's got uh, 22 total agents, I think it is. Nine of them are under the age of 29. By the way, they're all fantastic producers. They're averaging about two homes per month right now. All under 29. And she said when she sat down to do her presentation, when she sat down to, to prepare for Retso, what happened was the millennials came around her and said, hey, how can we help? How can we help you? And so they started helping her with the presentation, helping her redesign slides, rework the content, listening to her, helping her manage that. That's how the millennials are. You want to freak a millennial out, a really good agent in your office, when, when the sales stats come out each month, post it up there in a competitive way and put them at the top. 
They're freaking out because they think all their friends hate them now. They're not competing against everybody else. They're competing against their personal best. They were raised where everybody got a trophy. We didn't keep score. It's a soccer game with those. How do you do that? We figured out a way. We, we, in, in our heads, we were keeping score, but we didn't tell our parents that because it would have crushed them. So, but, but this is a generation where if you finish dead last, your parents are like, we're so proud of you. You're our champion swimmer. Look at the trophy you got. We'll put it on the shelf. And so we have trophies for 26th place. It's terrible. But this is the generation. This is who we are. This is how we were raised. To collaborate, not compete. Finally, we are the most eco-sensitive generation to come along in a very long time. Global warming, man-made global warming, climate change. Carbon footprint, SUVs are bad, local is good, big box stores bad, shipping bad, walking good, public transportation good. These are the messages we heard growing up. All of these things combine to create core values within the generation. Now mind you, that doesn't mean everybody agrees, that doesn't mean everybody thinks the same way, but you can look at it in polling data, in statistics, when they ask people and they look at it, they go, how do you feel about this? No matter the age range in this generation, no matter the political spectrum within this generation, where they fall, they're all much more eco-sensitive than previous generations at the same time in life. This has a big impact on property. So let's talk about it. We've got these four trends. What is this going to mean to the marketplace itself? Trend number one. If we look at, if we take work-life balance and we look at the fact that they don't want to work as hard, that they're going to have a higher tax burden, very likely, that as the baby boomers get older, they're going to be the ones that are carrying this burden. What it starts to look like is that they may make a lot of money when it comes to dollar amounts, but because of inflation and all these other factors, their buying power is going to be a lot less. Their buying, what they're able to afford is not going to be the same as what the boomers are or work. The boomers could buy the big houses on the big lots with the nice cars. This generation, A, doesn't want them, and B, can't afford them even if they did. So what, what is that going to mean for the McMansions? What is that going to mean for the big houses on the big lots? Rob Hahn has a theory, and, and his theory is polygamy. He's thinking, <laughs> I tried to say it with a straight face, I couldn't. He was actually running around last night going, it's all about polygamy. Whatever, Rob. So, um, and if you know Rob, you, you know he's serious. Um, he's convinced in 20 years they'll be legalized polygamy. Are you in here, Rob? Is he in here? He's not. He's going to be at it. Um, so, but, but it's, it's going to change what they can afford and what they want. Second, if we look at things, uh, if, if we take the multiculturalism, they don't like the suburbs. When you pull them, they really say that they grew up in the suburbs, but they don't want to live in the suburbs because all the houses look the same, all the people look the same, all the lifestyles look the same, everything looks the same. This was a generation that was told, you are unique, you are special, you are a, a, a one-of-a-kind individual. Express it. That's why they're all tatted up. That's why they have piercings in them places of the body that I can't physically imagine getting poked with a needle. But this is, this is a generation that finds unique ways of expressing themselves and showing people what they, what they appreciate and what they value. And so they want to be with people who are different than they are, where everything doesn't look the same. They like more multicultural environments. They want to be around people of different socioeconomic statuses, different races, different sexual preferences, different political ideas. They're very, very blended in that way. The suburbs are not. The suburbs tend to be very monochromatic, to be very standardized. That's not what they want. Then we look at the collaborative nature of this generation, and we start to see that what they really want are not the big lots with the fenced off yards. They want small lots with shared gathering spaces within the community parks, rec centers, places where they can get together with their friends, and, and places where they can, inside the community, get together. Local coffee shops, local restaurants, local bars that they can, they can get to with their friends that are, are locally owned. Because remember, big box is bad, local is good. 
So they like these shared gathering spaces where they can get together. So if you're working with millennials, keep some of these things in mind. Keep that in mind as you're working with your properties and you're going, who might this appeal to? Who am I actually targeting this property to? Finally, when we look at ego sensitivity, we see a big, big rise right now in homes that are being built to be energy efficient, to be smaller, to run on less fuel, to, to, to require less, to maintain, that are within walking distance, that are in urban areas, that have public transportation close by. This is where the trend is pushing. It's pushing towards more urban areas. Now I got in, into a really interesting conversation with Rob on his blog, which if you haven't read it, there's a couple blog posts where we talk about this. Um, Google Rob Hahn, Millennial, AOL, and you'll find them. But what we talked about is what happens, because there's, there's a string of data that's coming out right now that's showing the baby boomers are sitting on their big lots, their big houses, waiting. And they're waiting for the market to turn. And when the market turns, they're cashing out. They're going to cash out. And where are they going to move? The urban centers. That's where they want to move. They want to downsize. They want to get to the, to the city centers. They don't want, they're saying, I don't want to keep this up anymore. This is too much property. This is too much space. They want to get out and they want to move to the urban centers. What's that going to do to prices? It's going to drive them up. How are the millennials who aren't going to work as hard, who have a different viewpoint of, of what work-life balance looks like, who are going to have a higher tax burden, and a higher social burden, going to afford the city centers? if that's where they really want to live. They can't. The boomers are actually going to price the millennials very likely out of the urban centers. And it's, it, watch, it's set, the second the market turns around, this is what you're going to see happening. And I've talked to some agents who are saying that they're already seeing it with their boomer clients who have managed to get out before the downturn or even during it and still cash out with the good equity. They're moving towards the city centers. That's where they want to be, the more urban lifestyle. So what happens? The millennials are going to go out to the suburbs, and they're not going to like it, but they're going to have to go out there, but they're going to want something different from it. And so we're seeing builders create these multi-use communities, these work-live-play style communities, where your office is there, the little town center is there, you can walk, there's a park, there's smaller lots, smaller houses. You're seeing a big rise in these things, because the builders are realizing that what they were building isn't going to sell as well. They're in, it to, they're in the prediction business. They have to look at what's happening. They have to look at trends. They have to look at where things are going. And what they're seeing is that this market is shifting. The desirability of the urban sprawl that they created over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years is not desirable right now by very many people. So you've got to watch for these urban, you know, and, it, and, and what we're kind of talking about is really the urbanization of the suburbs. And you're seeing much more of that. You're seeing much more of that urbanization happening out in the suburbs. So just be mindful of these things because as, as an agent, you want to know, who are my buyers? What are they wanting? How do I position myself to be the expert in these areas, in these urban areas for the boomers and in the urbanized suburbs for the, for the millennials and the exers? How do you position yourself for that? If your position, there you are, Rob. Okay. Talked about polygamy earlier. Um, so how do you position yourself from a marketing perspective to handle this? Because if you're positioned as the McMansion expert, moving forward, you're going to have a very hard time getting new buyers and new sellers. You're going to well, you'll have a lot of sellers, but you'll have a hard time getting new buyers because it's going to become less and less desirable. And the price points are very likely going to drop on these a lot more than the urban centers are, or than the urbanized suburbs are. Something to keep in mind. Now, I want to let you in on a demographic. This is a very, very powerful demographic, a subset of millennials. They have a tremendous buying power. It's only going to get stronger. They're only going to become more important as we move forward. Any ideas what it is? Any guesses? Anybody? Women. Female millennials. If you're in business right now as an agent, as a broker, I want you to watch this generation, or this, this subset of this generation, 
female millennials. Here's why. In college right now, they make up 60% of all college students. They graduate college at a rate of one and a half times that of their male counterparts. They didn't just close the income gap in cities like Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, LA, Atlanta, Nashville. They flipped the income gap. They actually outburn men in their generation. They didn't close it, they flipped the income gap. They make more money than their male counterparts. That's huge. As single women, they're gonna be buying houses before they get married. We're already starting to see it. Single women bought 20% of all houses sold last year. This is a group that you really, really wanna watch and you really wanna start positioning for. If you know Ryan Copeland, you know that what he does is every week, He's got a newsletter designed specifically for women, specifically for millennial women, that features five homes. And it's called uh, Brian's Sweet Deals of the Week, Five Sweet Deals of the Week. It's decorated for women. It's written by a 23-year-old female. It's designed specifically for women. Every time he sends this out, he gets five to 10 contacts from people saying, oh my gosh, I love this house. How can I find out more? I'm not looking yet, but I'm looking in the next couple of months. How do I get in touch with you? Can I see this house? Five to 10 contacts per week for one newsletter geared towards a very small demographic, single female millennials. And they're not just gonna impact their own buying decisions, they're also gonna impact their family buying decisions. If you think they make more money than men now, Wait till that gap actually widens, and then in a marriage relationship, they're actually the primary breadwinner of the family. How much control do you think they're going to have over the property that they bought? A lot. And how many of them want to clean a 3,000 square foot house? Not many. So they're, they're shifting what they want, and they're shifting the order of operation, and they're shifting, they're going, you know what, I don't have to wait till I get married to have a house. I don't wait till I have to. I don't have to wait until I get married to have kids and do all these things. They're shifting the order of things. And, and you really, really want to get on the front end of that as much as you can. Unless you're in Nashville, then don't do it because Brian's got the lock on it. So, but wherever you are, really do this. Really focus in on this segment of the population. So let's talk about marketing and technology. Pretty much what we've been talking about here in the last two days. How is this generation going to change how we market and how we use technology? Let's talk about marketing first. They are the most marketed to generation in history. They see, on average, 1,700 to 3,000 advertising messages per day. They have a bullcrap meter like you wouldn't believe. They can spot marketing spin. They know when you're trying to sell them and when you don't care and when you don't want to have a relationship with them, they can spot it. They have a bull crap meter that when, you, when, when they sense spin, when they sense a marketing message that they don't want, they will tune you out and they have the tools to do it because they're not on the traditional media side. They're online and they can block you. They can report you as spam. They can do anything that they want and you can't stop them from doing that. So you have to focus not on the marketing message, but on the relational side of it. This is a generation that works off of trust. And we talk about it, it's, it's cliche in the real estate industry. The real estate industry is a relationship business. It's about relationships, right? We all talk about that. I've heard it, I don't know how many times. We're all about the relationships. And yet what happens? We hear social media, and we hear media, we go, ooh, it's the extension of television, radio, newspaper, yellow pages. So we get online and we push, 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 push. Check out my open house. Have you seen my new listing? Check out my open house. Have you seen my new listing? And I, I get followed by real estate agents all the time. And I go check out their profile and it's a list of their homes for sale. The problem, I don't live in Toledo, Ohio. I don't care. And yet I see it over and over and over again. I see it on Facebook pages. And 
So I've got two words. If you do that, and by the way, I know for a fact, because I've been trying to connect with people before I got here, there are real estate agents here that do that, because I've, I've been trying to connect with people before I got here, and I saw them shocked. So if you do that, if you post your real estate listings on your Facebook page or your Twitter page, I have two words for you. Stop it. Don't do it. Because we will tune you out. Thank you. I'm serious. We will tune you out. We see that we're gone. We're not. That's not engagement. That's not helping anybody. And then people go, "Well, social media doesn't work." Of course not. Not when that's what you're doing. We don't need another newspaper. We don't need another marketing message. We see too many as it is. So it's about building relationships. So how do you build trust? How do you engage with this generation? There's a couple ways, because I hear boomers ask me this all the time, especially. I don't know any millennials, except their kids. I don't know any millennials. How do I, how do I connect with them? There's two ways I'm going to give you, two tips. Number one, go where they are. Go where they are. Tech conferences are a fantastic place to meet millennials. Uh, local marketplaces, use meetup.com. It's a spectacular site to find shared interest groups. Go where they are and relate to them, help them. Real estate agents have some of the most powerful networks of anybody I've ever met. Use those networks to help them. You know why I'm standing up here? Because I met Brian Copeland at a conference. It was a non-real estate conference. He heard me speak. He started a relationship with me, and he helped me. I've never bought a piece of property from him, but I've referred him business. I've helped him because he helped me. That's what a relationship is. We know this instinctually, but we kind of freak out when we get on Twitter. We freak out when we get on Facebook and go, I have to tell them what I do. I have to post a real estate listing. No, you don't. You really don't engage. Another great way for boomers to connect with millennials, use your boomer clients. You have a network of boomers who bought from you. They have kids that are starting to hit that age. They're entering the marketplace. One idea you can do, create a first-time home buyer package, information, recommendations to, to inspectors, to bankers, to, to loan officers, to different people that you work with, that you respect in the industry, doing transactions that you like working with, and don't sell, give information. Tell them, what does it look like to buy a home? What can you expect? What do you need to watch out for? How can you prepare your family, your finances, for the loan approval process? Give them information because nobody else is. Everybody's trying to market to them. And educate them, inform them. Give that to the parents, and then when the parents turn around and hand it to the kids, you've done something because millennials trust their parents more than any other group. So much so that they'll actually put their parents on their job application as a reference. They, they do. That's how much they trust their parents. They love their parents. So if you've got boomer clients, use your clients, connect with your clients, and use them to connect with their kids. It's a great way of connecting up with them. Finding clever ways of using your existing contacts to get down to the next generation. And position yourself as an agent who is reputable, who is trustable. Trustworthy, whatever. It's just coined terms up here today. Um, so this is, this is what you got to do. you got to connect with them where they are, and you got to use their existing the parents. Let's talk technology. Technology is the single greatest indicator to millennials of your quality and your ability as an agent. How you use technology is more important to them than the number of letters after your name. They don't care. They don't care how many sales awards you've won. They don't care how many times you've been a best-selling agent in your area, they want to know, do you understand them, and are you where they are? Do you use the tools that they use, and do you use them properly? Do you get it? Do you understand it? Do you connect with them? Do you relate with them on it? Technology is critical. Everything we've been learning about here, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Ubongo, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. You've got the, the conversation, as Jeff was saying earlier, we're, we shouldn't be having this conversation of should we, shouldn't we, 
I don't know, maybe not. I'll, I'll dip my toe in the water. We were past that. It's happened. It's not going to happen. It's already happened. The digitization of the consumer has happened. It's not happening. You can't wait on these things any longer. And you've got to dive in. You've got to experiment. You've got to play, as Jeff said. Have fun with it. Figure out ways of just engaging your audience using these tools and be where they are. Zillow, Trulia, City Data, engaging. And by the way, every time I say Zillow at a real estate conference, somebody comes up to me afterwards and complains about Zillow. And they say, but have you seen the comments? Everybody rips apart agents in the comments section. You know why? They say, now is a great time to buy. When isn't it a good time to buy? That's what people want to know, because that's marketing spin. It's only a good time to buy at the individual level. Zillow is 30% bigger than Trulia. It gets 30% more traffic than Trulia, and Trulia is where everybody wants to hang out. You go where the people are, and you shine like a diamond amidst the crack. Because there's going to be an argument, there's going to be arguments going on, there's going to be debates in every comment system. Avoid it, and just find ways of connecting with the people who have legitimate questions. Answer them honestly. Engage with them, give them real information. That's how you set yourself apart. That's how you use Zillow and Trulia and realestate.com and homes.com and every, just go where they are. Figure out how to use these tools, and if you don't know, hire somebody who does. Find a consultant, find somebody to, to bring in and teach you how to do this stuff. Keep coming to these conferences. Keep coming to Redso because next year there's going to be different tools and there's going to be different things and you've got to stay on top. All right, I want to wrap up with uh, Robert. Been talking here primarily to uh, agents, primarily talking about the future of the marketplace. But I want to talk to brokers for a second. And I actually, agents, you're going to get something out of this too. At this conference, I've been really surprised to hear the debate kind of raging between the agents and the brokers. I've heard this from the agents. My broker doesn't get it. They don't get it. I've heard this from the, from the brokers. Get out there and sell. It's what we're, we're hired to do, right? I mean, that, get out there and sell. So that the brokers are saying, go sell. The agents are saying, help. How do we reconcile these two? How do we bridge this gap? Because the brokers feel like the agents need to stop wasting so much time on unproven tools and get out there and sell, pick up the phone, prospect. And the agents feel like, these are the tools I need to do my job. I can't fully explain how I know, but I know this is where it's going. And I've got to learn this stuff, which means I've got to take time away from selling to come to conferences on my own dime so that I can learn this stuff. So how do we, how do we blend these two things? How do we bring the, and, and, and how does the millennial generation tie into all of this? This is a generation that will not do business under the old model. This is a generation that is looking to change industries and businesses to match their value system, to match what they believe is most important in their lives. Their value system is driving everything. And as they enter the workforce, they're looking at the traditional brokerage model and they're saying, that's not for me. How do I know this? Because the average age of an agent right now, 52. I actually heard last night that that went up to 58, but I haven't been able to verify that, so I'm using 52. 52 years old. If your business is dependent on 52-year-olds only, you're going to be out of business when they retire. We've got to figure out a new system, a new way of creating a culture, creating an environment, creating a business that attracts the next generation into our industries, into our organizations. How do we do that? Well, understanding what they value. Most people think it's money. 
It's not. Money is not the most important thing to millennials. Culture is, and autonomy is. Autonomy, you guys are set. You get to say when I work, how much I make, how much I work, what days I work, what my own schedule is. You get to set your own schedule. That is a, a, a very appealing thing to millennials because that's what they want. They want control over their schedules. They want control over how much they work, when they work, how they do these things. They want autonomy in those areas. And, and so real estate is perfectly set up as an industry to be a place for millennials and yet they're not coming in. Why? Because the second component is missing. Culture. And what does a culture look like? What does that mean? Well, they view most brokerages, most companies in the real estate industry as stuffy and antiquated. Behind the times. They go to the websites. They go to their social presences. They look online. They go, it just doesn't feel like it's, a, it's an industry for me. How do I reconcile this? How do I get, I don't know that I want to be in this industry, but they do find companies. They do find nuggets of companies in those industries, and they are flocking to brokerages that are building cultures around three things. Innovation, technology, and success. Because innovation and technology in this economy breeds success. The technology is a tool, yes, but these are the tools. What we've been talking about are the tools of the future, much like the cell phone. When the cell phone came out, agents realized that this is where things were going. This is the next thing. Smartphones were the next thing after that. You know, it's constantly evolving. It's constantly moving. And so brokerages, here's what I would challenge you to do. Lead the innovation and the change. Lead the charge on this stuff. Don't wait for your agents to do it. Find ways to work with them, to support them, to coach them, to mentor them, to bring them along. And if it's a millennial, coaching is huge. Mentorship is huge. They were raised with coaches. They were raised to, to have that constant feedback loop. They want that. They want to be taught, but not taught necessarily the, the specifics of the tools. They want to know, how do I negotiate? I don't know how to negotiate. They've not been taught that. And yet they, they're sent to a few classes and then they're told, go out and sell. But education in this environment is a continuing process. It's constant evolution. It's, it, and it is a broker. It's leading that change within your organization. Fascinating conversation with Christina Wise. This is somebody that if you're a broker, I encourage you to connect up with her. Talk with her. Find out what she's doing because she is taking some of the best people of this generation and she is applying them with technology to making a huge success of her business and it's continuing to grow in a down economy, in a down market. And I've heard it won't scale. It won't scale and it will scale. It will scale. Caring about people will scale. Zappos proved that. It was bought for over a billion dollars what they did is they cared about their employees first. And this is the other thing. If, you're, if you lead a company, if you run a company, your primary client is not the person buying your product. It's your employee, it's your agent. Most brokers do not have as much interaction with the client, with the home buyer or the home seller, as the agents do. Invest into the agents. And when you invest into the agents and you see them as your client, how can you serve them? How can you help them? How can you ensure their success? They're going to go out on the front lines and they're going to service your community, your client base, better than you could possibly imagine. You invest inward in the company and you send your team out. This is what's coming. This is what the millennial generation is bringing into the industry. They're bringing disruption. They're changing the way industries and businesses work. They're disrupting industries, and they're doing three things. They're building new companies, they're helping companies pivot to adapt, or they're destroying companies. Not intentionally, but because what they do is they go in and they bring about change. They bring about innovation, and they go to the organizations that are doing they find those companies where they build those companies, and that's where they go. We've seen it happen in industry after industry. Tower Records, gone. Block 
Blockbuster Video, Dawn, Newsweek, sold for a buck. Newsweek sold for a dollar. This is incredible stuff that we're talking about. This, they are changing industry after industry. It's not going to stop. Real estate is not immune from this. Most of the innovation in real estate is actually coming from third-party vendors, not from within the brokerages, not from within the community. That's got to change. Lead the innovation from within. All right, let me wrap up, and then we're just going to take some questions if we have some time. Um, I want to leave you with this one thought. Technology and youth are disrupting industries. They're changing businesses. Millennials will not save the real estate industry. They're going to change the real estate industry. The question is, how are you going to adapt to capitalize on that? Because with change, risk and opportunity, and with risk and opportunity comes money and growth and success and, and an ability to capitalize on this stuff and drive it into the future. That's what I want you to do. I want everybody in here to succeed, and you're setting yourself up for that by being here, by being at conferences like Retso. Now it's about going forward and saying, you know, it's not about going back. It's about moving forward and figuring out how do we innovate, how do we continue moving forward, and how do we capitalize on this? Because we're in business to make money. That's why we're in business. So how do we capitalize on these two massive forces that are disrupting industry after industry, and is your business prepared? Thank you so much. Let's fill some questions. Awesome. If you've got a question, I'm going to have to go. <laughs> Why am I not surprised? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I understand. I got to defend myself first. So, uh, oh. but this actually does fit in with the polygamy uh, thing, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, you mentioned something that you know. Obviously, you and I have talked about. Right? Yeah. And we've actually, but I thought it'd be interesting to have this discussion. Sixty percent of college grads, as you mentioned, are female, and you said. The single female buyers, therefore, will be an incredibly powerful subsection, right? Yes. Subsegment. And as the income gap grows over time, because as we know, college graduates, etc., cetera, et cetera, okay. So the flip side of that, of course, is 40% of college grads are men, which leaves 20% of women without mates. So. Look at me. So. There it is. It's not a polygamy thing, but realistically speaking, in the long run, right, as you look at your own generation, if really single females are the dominant driving economic force, what does housing needs look like when your 41-year-old never married college educated lawyer? It's probably not the suburban house, even an urbanized suburban house. That's one, one thing. <clears throat> the second point to make, which you did not touch on, I know. The second question and the point I would like you to address is, you're, you're Gen Y, right? Yeah. But you're gainfully employed, you're, you're kind of at the advanced yes. leading edge. Fact of the matter is the boomers are retired pretty soon, mm -hmm. and your generation will be stuck with the bill. Yeah. Right? Medicare, Social Security, all these government programs, you guys are probably the lost generation unless we see some major economic upheaval. You're probably looking at something closer to 65, 70% total tax burdens on your, on your income. How do you imagine your generation is going to be able to afford houses going on in the future? And could you keep your answer for less than 30 seconds? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Simple supply and demand. There's a, there's a huge dearth of houses, or excuse me, a huge wealth of houses out there. The housing values are going to have to come down to match the supply, or the demand, excuse me. So it's, if, if what Rob said is true, and I'm not sure I necessarily buy into everything that he's, I, I don't necessarily agree with everything, but if he's right, if that does in fact happen, all home prices across the board are going to have to come down because the demand is not going to be high enough to, to buy up all the supply. It's just not. It's a simple supply and demand problem. It's going to bring housing prices way down to these right. Here we go. Hi. That was great. Thank you. Um, how do the millennials feel about working with old lady Barbara Realtor? Assuming I can manage my phone and then few things like 
actually, I, here's, here's the truth. We're they trust boomers parents. more than any other generation because their parents are Thank boomers. You. So it, it's a huge opportunity within organizations, and it's something that I encourage organizations to do, is find bi-directional mentoring opportunities. Let the youth help the boomers with technology, and let the boomers come in and help the millennials with some of the soft skills, like negotiating, managing the client after the sale, things that they're not going to learn on Google. But if they can Google it, they're going, well, why, why are you going to teach me something I can just Google? But you can't Google negotiation techniques. You can, but it's not going to work. You can't Google certain things. So if find those unique opportunities for bi-directional mentoring. Great question. I, I have to say that this is probably going to make me feel older than I have <laughs> ever felt in my entire life. But, um, and I'm not going to hijack anybody's put on any of your time. But the two questions. Yeah. So first of all, if the millennials BS meter is so high, mm -hmm. is it not going off all the time because they're talking so much BS about <laughs> feeling economic, you know, un sensitive about things, and never, yeah, this is the same generation that drives two freaking blocks to go to a gosh darn Starbucks. Nice. <laughs> You know, I like work-life balance and things like that and want to save the rainforest, but tweeting about it and going to frickin' Brazil and standing in front of a tractor are two different frickin' things. So, I, I just, if you have any insight, I actually put a tweet out. It's like, do you have any, like, points or any statistics that say, hey, we're really caring about the earth and ozone and everything like that. Well, you know, we want worth balance and want to be able to watch American Idol on our laptops. So, if you have any stats with that, that's, that's fantastic. Secondly, it's like, with what is the actual, because I mean, we have our NAR stats and things like that, what is the millennial feeling about home ownership right now? You know, let me tackle that because I actually have some stats to back that up. Um, and the, the other one, there are stats that talk about work-life balance and all those that I don't have them memorized, so I don't, don't want to misquote them. Um, but if you want, email me, Travis at TravisRobertson.com, and I'll track them down. I've got them in Evernote, and speaker about Evernote, use them like crazy. Um, and, and I've got a lot of this in there. So to, to go to your point, though, about their, their perception of uh, real estate, they actually uh, test. Right now, there was a recent poll that was done by Trulia. I think it came out in January or February. Um, and, and Trulia was polling uh, to figure out what is the perception of the future of real estate among the different generations. Millennials actually tested the most optimistic about the future of the, of the real estate industry and the ability to use it to build wealth. They're actually very optimistic about it, and, and again, ability to buy it is a whole different thing than their ability to want it. And, and so there is that difference, but they, from, from a, a desirability standpoint, they really do want to be in real estate, and they view it as part of the American dream. It's just looking different as part of that American dream. So, great, and I think, by the way, I think it was about 68% don't quote me on that, but I'm almost positive it was 68% are optimistic about the future of real estate, and that was higher than any other generation. Yes. You mentioned the, uh, the broker needs to bring the millennials into the real estate business, but they don't like the old model. Yes. How does he do that, or she do that, when you have the boomers that like the recognition, that like the, the, the awards, that like their picture in the paper because they have the most listings? and So they, they've got like two cultures. How do they blend those and not... Uh, yeah. Great question. We're going to make a lot of enemies with this. So here's, here's the truth. The boomers are not the future of the industry. They're going to win, if for no other reason, millennials are going to win out in the what do we want war for no other reason than attrition. If they don't win any other way, they will win by attrition because boomers will retire and they will the mortality rate is only going to pick up. I'm not saying kick those people out. What I'm saying is you've got to train them and you've got to prepare them that just because, and, and this is a great thought here, I, I, not, it's not my own thought, I wish I could remember who said it. What brought you here, what got you to this level of success is not enough to keep you here moving forward. There has to be constant change, there has to be constant evolution, there has to be an ability to adapt moving forward. And so I look at it and I go, you know what? They may not want to change, so the very first thing to do is help them understand how this is actually going to help them 
to help frame the change, to help them understand that this is not really optional. We have to start moving in this direction for the future of the business. But we want your support, we want your input, we want your feedback, we want to figure out how we as a team, because we're a team, at the end of the day, a company is a team of people, and if the company fails, everybody loses. Nobody wants that. So we have to, it doesn't just start by you walk in and you go, okay, guess what guys, we're changing everything. It's a, it's a, it's a process of educating and informing and helping them understand why helping them actually understand that in the future, this is actually going to be more beneficial for them if they hang around. And you want them to hang around. You don't want to get rid of them. That's not what this is about. But if, if you don't change and you cater to the generation that is going to be leaving the workforce in the next 10 years, you're going to be very, very far behind for getting that next generation to actually enter your company. The pain point at that stage, the pain of changing, the pain of pivoting, much, much bigger and almost impossible to make. Borders waited way too long, and I nearly cried. I love books, I love borders. Borders waited way too long to try and take on Amazon, and they couldn't do it. They waited way too long, and they actually gave Amazon their fulfillment, their online fulfillment. They said, here, Amazon, take it. It's really not that important. It's not going to be that big. Whoops. You know, so if, if, you're, if you're waiting for that generation, if you're catering to a generation that's got maybe 10 to 15 years left in the industry on the whole, to have, and, and we're, they're already not the biggest generation in the, the workforce anymore. So we've got to look at the reality of it and go, this is where it's going. This isn't about right versus wrong, but it is a change that's happening and we've got to figure out how do we manage that change in a way that allows for the survival of our business. Because I will guarantee you, like every other industry, in three, five, or ten years, some of the stalwarts in the real estate industry will not be around in like five or ten years. It's just not going to be that way. There are certain companies that will not make that transition and will not be able to catch up to the companies that do it and that take on that challenge right now and don't kick the can down the road. So, great, fantastic question. One last question. Yeah. Okay, so with every generation, there's the element of the, the now that you're talking about. At this point in time, you're talking about them being first-time homebuyers. But Question, and I get asked that one all the time, and, and the, the, the same exact analogy is drawn with the hippies of the 60s and the movement of the millennials right now. And, and here's what I would say is there will be some things that continue to change as they get older. There will be some things that as they have families, as they get jobs, as they do different things and they move through different stages of life. Will their thinking on certain things change to some degree? Yes. But the same thing was said about the, the, the 60s generation by the older generation. Once they grow up, they'll change out of it. They're, they're, they're going to be much more traditional. We actually saw that didn't happen. They are very, very much, boomers are not like their parents at all on a lot of levels. They outspend their parents, they outearn their parents, they outwork their parents, they uh, outpoliticized their parents. They did so many things that were drastically different, that were part of that core value system of how they were raised, that you really never get rid of certain parts of who you are at your core. It's a, it's a very hard thing for most people to change. People don't like change. And so changing on a grand scale to the point where they actually look more like boomers is not going to happen. Will there be different things that tweak and different things that come out of it? Sure. But I just don't think politically, I don't think uh, socially, I don't think that on, on enough levels that they're going to normalize or be more like boomers. I actually think that they're going to be a very distinct generation as every other generation is. So it's a, it's a great question. But No, I no, no, no. I wasn't saying they're boomers. I'm just saying that, but, but it's, it's it, crap. <laughs> Oh, I wasn't saying that. No, but it, it's, it's a great question, and I do get asked it all the time. So, you guys, I'm going to be around. There's a YPN party after this uh, through uh, GAR, and uh, we'd love to hang out and talk with you more about this. You can hit me up on Twitter or Facebook, and I respond to every single tweet. So, um, I'm kind of a Twitter addict. So, just use the Twitter handle Travis Rowe, and, and I'll respond. Travis at TravisRobertson.com, and uh, you can go there and check out more stuff. So, thank you guys so much. Thank you.